welcome, welcome to Revolution. Um, as you can tell, I'm not Jay. Um, I'm a tattooed person, but I'm not Jay. Um, Jay is actually on vacation with his wife out in California, and so he asked me to uh, come and speak today. So I don't know if I am as long-winded as Jay, but I'm uh, going to try my best. And he pretty much told me to talk on whatever I wanted to. Um, so I'm going to entitle this, or I entitled this little talk, All You Need Is Love, kind of paying homage to the Beatles, because who doesn't like the Beatles? Um, and also, um, just with the celebration of Easter not so long ago, um, I think love is something that we all need to hear. Um, I guess a little bit of background about myself. My name's uh, Brian Odland. Uh, I'm, I just graduated, or I'm about to graduate in two weeks from Bethel Seminary um, with my Doctor of Ministry. Um, and I'm also um, in the process of being a pastor in the United Church of Christ. Um, and I've followed Jay's po uh, podcast and revolution over the last number of years from when he was in Atlanta and uh, Brooklyn and now here in Minneapolis. So we've talked a, lot, a little bit, Jay and I, and I've also uh, interviewed him for my dissertation back in December. That's kind of where we started talking some more. And last week he asked me, I was one of two people here, and he asked me if I wanted to talk this week, so here I am. Alrighty, are you guys ready? Um, it's going to be short and sweet, maybe not that long, but I think the, what I wanted to talk about is all that we need is love. Last week I, at the church where I attend, I preached on 1 John f uh, 4, which um, pretty much says that if you can't love your neighbor, um, that you're doing it wrong. And I'm very, it's tough for us to um, love our neighbors, you know, sometimes it's just tough to love yourself, it's tough to love your spouse, uh, tough to love siblings or relatives, but it's something that I really think the Bible points us to, and we get it wrong, and obviously I think the church in many ways uh, gets it wrong, um, because there's so much hurt and pain and strife within the church. A um, couple stories I just want to read that have impacted me and I think is helpful is one of my favorite stories in the Bible is Jesus and Zacchaeus. I was I grew up in the, when I grew up in the church in the Sons of God like Jay and others. Um, we heard that what was that song? Um, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Was a wee little man. What wee little man was he? I always liked that. I wonder how short he really was, though. Um, I'll just read this here real quick. It's in Luke 19. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small of stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried, and he came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to, to be a guest at a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the, ha Behold, Lord, the half of all my goods I give to the poor, and, I have def and if I have defrauded anyone, of anything, I, re, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come unto this house, since he is also a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And I think the point that I want to focus on the most there is not all the salvific and salvation stuff, but the whole point of the story of Zacchaeus and Jesus, that interaction. And to me, when I was younger, I thought it was just cool that Jesus wanted to meet Zacchaeus and just hang out, and and it was I'm a small person myself, and so I hopefully I, if I was ever in his position, I would climb up to a tree or in a tree just to see Jesus. But the part that really hit me and resonated with me, and I think the thrust of the story is, is this person Zac, or Zacchaeus, who I believe was a tax collector or 
uh, or yeah, I was a tax collector. In the Bible, that being a tax collector and a prostitute were probably about the two lowliest things that a person could do. Um, and in that culture, it was very, it was very negative. And I think it was amazing how Jesus would, one of his best friends was a prostitute, and one of the people who he built the church on with Matthew and wrote the gospel uh, was a tax collector. So these two people, these two kind of uh, lifestyles or professional choices that this man and woman made were the two lowliest, and Jesus was like, hey, I want to hang out with you, I'm going to be friends with you. And I think with, with uh, Zacchaeus, when Jesus saw him, and Jesus said, hey, come down, I want to come over to your house. It wasn't just like he saw Zacchaeus, gave him attention, or said, you know, come down, I want to talk to you. He went further than just saying, let's talk, let's hang out. He actually went to his house. So he obviously did it in front of a crowd, in front of people. And I'm sure if we were there at that time, you would be like, what is this Jesus person doing? Like, I, I just try to, when I read these stories or when I read the Bible, I just try to put myself in that position. I try to say, like, what would it look like if I was there? This person, like, we want a king, we want a ruler, but this person is coming in to be this king or ruler, and he's so unlike anything we've ever imagined. And to to uh, just have that interaction that them being there would have just been amazing. I think that another story I want to tell real quick is Jesus and the woman of Samaria. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's a long chapter. Um, just the part though, Jesus and this woman of Samaria, which I'll pick up. It's ch uh, John chapter four. Start at 16 and then I guess go for a few chapter, or a few verses. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband, Jesus said to her. You are right in saying that I have no husband. For, for if you have had five you have had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is there a place where we ought to worship? Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Um, I could go longer, but I think the, the main thrust of this story, first of all, a Samaritan person, a Samaritan woman um, or man, was someone that uh, Jesus and the Jewish people should not ever have in contact. They were like polar enemies, polar opposites. And for Jesus, first of all, to have an interaction with this woman was very scandalous in a lot of ways. And for him to actually talk to this woman uh, was a, like a double whammy where like she's a woman, A, and B, she's a Samaritan. This is a person that we should be uh, opposed to and against. And I, I, I just find, like every time I, I, I read these stories and when, in the tradition that I grew up in, we always heard, the, uh, these stories were always kind of shoved down our throats. These sermons were always taught with these stories. And they were all just like, well, look at how cool Jesus is. And like he talked to this woman but they never really went into the meat, I think, of the story, which is that he was so... Jesus came, I, in a lot of ways, not just to teach us how to live, but in my own personal opinion, he kind of came to piss off culture a little bit. He kind of came to be like, hey, you know what, like, this, is, this society sucks, this society is very exclusivistic, this society is very, you know, sexist, this is very, you know, damning. And I, I'm coming to switch that all up on its side. And you don't hear that anymore, I don't think, in a lot of churches. Some churches, maybe more progressive churches, I don't know, will preach it. But I think just on my journey and, and my own faith, when I read these stories, I, it, it, it's they're coming alive to me in, in a way that I was never taught. Like, my parents never taught me that. They taught me great, you know, great things, but 
it was just like, read these stories. These stories are great. Look at these gospel stories. Look at all this stuff. You know, I appreciate it and I enjoyed it, but I just really thought that in the tradition that I was raised that um, they never really just showed how, how, in a lot of ways, Jesus was kind of rebellious. I remember actually when I was in the youth group at the church I grew up in, uh, they always wanted to make us students feel accepted and cool. So they're like, "Why don't we, you know, why don't we have you guys preach every now and then?" So I was like, "Okay, that's that's great. Let's let's. I want to come up with a sermon." So I came up with a sermon and I worked all hard on it. Um, as a, I guess as a sophomore, junior in high school could, and what I realized about the Bible, and I. I Worked hard on it. I was all excited to have my cool little like bullet points and my manuscript and all that. And my I get up there to talk about it, and the name of my I entitled my sermon "Jesus is a Rebel." My youth pat before I could even get that out of my mouth, my youth pastor came up there and took me away from that and more or less kind of just this, this, did this like de facto worship service. And afterwards, he came up to me and he's like, "Brian, it's like what?" He's like you can't talk like that. I'm like, talk like what? What did I do that was wrong? He's like, you can't, you can't have a sermon about Jesus as a rebel. I'm like, why can't I have a sermon about that? He's like, well, that's just so scandalous. You can't say that he was a rebel. Like, Jesus came to save the lost, and we need to repent, and we need to do all this stuff. And I said, but if you look at the Bible, if you look at these scriptures, and you look at these stories, I said, Jesus was a very rebellious person. He, I said, he came, he came to totally changed this, the, the culture, the mindset of, of the society that he was in. And I said, all these other people wanted this king that sits on a throne and tells people what to do. But in God's mentality, he sent his son down to be like, you guys have it messed up. You guys have it wrong. You guys have it just screwed up. And if you want to be part of this so-called kingdom, you're going to have to work here. You're going to have to follow these teachings of Jesus, my son. And I said it to my youth pastor, he was just dumbfounded, like, almost like he paid attention in youth group. Like, he, it's like he paid attention in church where all these little kids were, all the kids around were like, let's just go out and play kickball. Let's go to a Twins game. Let's do whatever. Let's just start flirting with it at, at church. And I, I was really wrestling with these stories. And, I, and to, even as a younger age, these stories in the Bible started coming alive to me. And all that I could just think of was... I feel like the Bible that I read sometimes and the Bible and the stories that I, I was taught in church were complete and polar opposites. I don't know if any of you out here in the audience or listening on, on, online have ever thought that, but uh, that's even still to this day sometimes that something that haunts me. I'm like, am I reading it the right way? Or is everybody else that I know who talks about it just sucks and gets it wrong. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's just me. I, I just look at the Bible and I'm like, Jesus is a Jesus is someone who is full of love and compassion and loves everyone no matter what. Um, it's actually a funny thing I wrote in my dissertation. I wrote on church unity and reconciliation, which I th I, I hope that the church one day could do. Um, I'm very skeptical that it can, just because I feel like so many churches want to be. Uh, separatists or exclusivists um, but I remember I had like four or five people who had to read it and one of the guys who was our technical reader who was a pastor for like 20 30 years and who now um, lives out in California I wrote something in my dissertation that said that I believe that God created everything and called it good I said and whether that's humanity whether well, that's the solar system, the earth, everything in it. I said, I feel like he created the Imagio Dei, which is the image of God. And through all the corrections, the, the biggest glaring one to me, which he writes really big, he circles it and gives it back to me. He's like, you're wrong. And I just was kind of like, I was like, screw you. Why am, I, why am I wrong on that? And I do feel that, you know, God did create everything and everyone and that it is in his eyes good, and that it is love. Anyway, I don't want to get on, get, uh, don't want to go too far in my soapbox, but maybe I should. <laughs> I think uh, the thrust that I want to talk about um, 
other than these two stories is yes, all you need is love. And I really, it sounds cliche to so many, I know, but really, uh, at the core of the, at the core of scripture, I would say even in the Old Testament leading up to the New Testament, and even if you start at the New Testament, going back to this, the whole story of who Jesus was, you know, his teachings, whether you believe everything he did was real, if you believe in miracles, I'm not here to tell you you have to believe all that's true or you know, make you swallow that pill. But for me, I look at the teachings of Jesus and that's what I want to focus on. And that's what I want to base my uh, base my ministry on. I want to base my friendships. I want to kind of base my whole aura of who I am as a person just on his teachings. Not saying that other stories and other people in the Bible were not good, but I'm like, those were just messed up effed up people just like me and everyone else. But Jesus is this person who we're supposed to, you know, mimic and emulate. And I think for me, where I'm at in my, in my own journey, in my faith and in life, I think it's something that's really influenced, or really that God's worked on my heart, is just loving people, you know? And uh, like I said, it sounds cliche, but really, the world sucks sometimes, but actually most of the time it sucks. Um, it's very monotonous, it's very get up, go to work, whatever you want to do. With me, I've been in school since I was five, so get up, go to school, uh, go to work, repeat. And sometimes you just get lost in, in the, the beauty of just loving people. And sometimes it's hard, sometimes there's just people in our lives that just absolutely want to probably punch in the face when we see them. <laughs> Maybe we're related to them, maybe they're friends, maybe somebody hurt your feelings many years ago and you can never get, get over it, but I really feel that in the scripture, in these stories in particular, Jesus is, you know, more or less just saying that uh, we just need to love. There's no, no other way around it. And I guess for me, my biggest frustration is growing up in the church. I grew up in evangelicalism my whole life, and I know there's a lot of people in evangelicalism who aren't, pardon my French, assholes, but I think most of them are. <laughs> um, a lot of great people, but uh, I think a lot of them, what they don't teach in the church is just to love. We're very, in my tradition I grew up in, it was very inclusivistic. It was very are not, not not inclusive, excuse me, exclusivistic, where I grew up in my church, we would always say, oh, let's go work with other churches. Let's go um, let's go door to door and tell people about Jesus. And as the young kid, I was like, sweet, let's go do this. That's awesome. And we would always go to the super rich part, because our church was very, almost in like this very segregated part of St. Paul, where on one side of the church, it was a very rich white white people. And on the south side of the church was a couple blocks was more of a ethnically diverse, more poor um, drug, drug and alcohol kind of fueled area. And the one time we went down to that south part, because a whole bunch of us students were like, "Let's really go down there. Let's really go down there." I remember that these two parents of the church came with us, and these two women in front of us they didn't know who we were. We weren't. They didn't know we were part of a church. And this, they turned around and asked us if we had pot. And this is kind of very common, maybe that's what a lot of parents ask other people around. And they got, like, our, the, the, our two par parent volunteers were so uh, shocked that this would ever even happen. Like, who in the right mind would ask people for pot, you know, right on the street? Um, and we went back, like, we didn't even go do the rest of our stuff they were going to do, and they were just so shocked and, and appalled. And from that point on, when that happened, for the number of years I was still at the church, they always went to that northern part. They always would skip the area, and they would always just go and act all churchy and Jesus-y with people who they felt that they could resonate with. It just so happened that most of the people at that church were, you know, all coming in from suburbia to this supposed inner city church. Um, that was a big issue that made me kind of, you know, question, are we doing it wrong? Are we doing it wrong? I remember, yeah, if my mom was here, she would probably be smiling, but in our, 
in the church that I grew up, we have in most churches, there's like a Bible or a hymnal, and then there's like little prayer cards you can write on and just put them in the basket or whatever. And I remember as a little kid, I mean, I, I mean, I paid attention all the time. I feel like the more I talk about it, I was just a weird kid. <laughs> like who? Sometimes I talk about it. I'll talk to my wife or I'll talk to friends, and I'm like, what? Why was I like that? Who does that? And I would sit down. I would hear my pastor just like yelling at his top of his lungs. It's about whatever, like hellfire and brimstone, and everyone sucks. And unless they repent, they're going to go to hell. I remember a lot of those sermons, but. I remember, you know, I, I would write down, like, Mom, Dad, you know, the pastor's telling everyone that we need to love everyone, and people need to come to church, people need to love Jesus. But I was like, all the, everyone that's in our church looks the same. They act the same. We all look to sit, you know, I'm like, we're all white. We're all probably middle class to being rich. We're all, you know, so on and so forth. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, where's the prostitute? that we read about in the Bible. What, why aren't they here? Why, where, where's the ethnic diversity? And I said, where, you know, where are people who look different, who act different, and who struggle with things? I said, maybe we struggle with things yeah, here in church, but we're very hush-hush, we're very quiet about it, because we don't want people to know our, our business and our issues. And as a 10, 11, 12-year-old, my parent, I feel, I, I wish I wasn't like, like, I was like in my parents' brains just to be like, what is going on with our kid? Is he okay? Is he like mentally unstable? And maybe this is why I went to all these years of schooling because I just had these questions that I kept asking and asking and asking. But even back then, and that those kind of questions and thoughts have always haunted my mind um, my whole life and, and, and where I'm at still in life. I'm just going to check the time. I didn't want to make it past 4 o'clock, so bear with me. Um, I mean, I could go on countless, countless um, stories about stuff like that, but I think the biggest thing where I'm at and what kind of led me away from my journey from growing up very evangelical to now being, uh, I hate to use labels, but I'm, I'm more progressive, I'm more liberal leading, I have no qualms or issues in saying that, um, but they are labels, but I feel like where I'm at is a lot of people in the church don't love people, and it comes across, especially what hurt and burdened my soul is with the GLBT community. And I grew up in a, in, in a family and in a tradition that didn't value those people, that didn't value, uh, that didn't even really tell us about sexuality except for in a very damning way. And the older I got and the more I quite, you know, question things and you know I never had a family member who was gay or questioning or anything like that or transgendered but the older I got I had more friends and and met more people and I was like you know in the tradition that I was raised in like I was you're you're bad people you're supposed to go to hell you're supposed to something's really wrong with you and it just never sat right in me I was like this is just BS this isn't right and I was telling Jay a couple weeks ago, I said, one of the toughest things to do is not being able to be open with your family about some of your views and some of your opinions. And when I, when I told my mom and my brother a couple years ago, I was like, I just don't think your views are right on that. And I said, I feel like you're being very exclusivistic, and I feel that Jesus calls us to love. And they're like, well, it says right here in the Bible, and it says right here. And I said, well, and then you're just, you know, picking verses. I, I, in my interpretation, I think they're picking verses out that don't really mean what they mean. Um, they're doing uh, an ISO Jesus, which is reading into the text, or they really have bad hermeneutical interpretation. But people could say that about me, I guess, so whatever. But I just looked at it, and what keeps coming back to me is just that that whole, that whole concept of love, all you need is love, and, you know, even it's a struggle. It's a struggle when you don't have a, a view that's very favorable, but you know it's a view that's right, a, a view that you know that this is, this is what it's all about, and I have no problem telling friends and family or whoever that, 
You know, it, they're like, what's the whole crux of this Jesus person? Um, what is what is the whole crux of his teaching and and all that stuff? Is I said, there's a lot of important stories. There's a lot of historical content and great things, but really, what it comes down to is love. And we have to love now. We have to love God, but not only that, we have to love each other, and we have to love everyone else around us, whether we like them or not. And I feel like we, we hear it and you, you always see in movies where like it always ends up people mostly reconciling or loving and being all lovey-dovey and it kind of pulls on your heartstrings a little bit and then we turn it off and then we act like complete dicks to each other. <laughs> and it's so easy to do that and I could be up here for a week just talking about love and about how we're supposed to do that. But I'll just leave it with, you know, with 1 Corinthians 13. You know, I don't want to read the whole thing, but it's faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is wow. love. I think, I think all the writers of the Bible, whoever wrote them, um, they, they, were, they took the message and the words of Jesus very strong. And that whole mentality of love is something that not only just the church, but people desperately, desperately need to hear. And I hope all of us who are here and people who are listening, just just try to be agents of love. Just try to be people of love, because God created us and everything because He loves us. He loves, uh, you know, He loves His creation, but He also wants His creation to love each other. And if we can't love each other, then we're in a whole world of crap. So hopefully that was all right. Hopefully you guys liked it. It's kind of on the spot. He asked me like three days ago to do it. So <laughs> hopefully it's our. Uh, hopefully it's good, and hopefully I'll be back some other time. But um, I guess I'll just close in prayer real quick, and then we can chit chat if we want or whatever. Dear God, just thank you for this time here uh, at Revolution, and. Just help us to be people who love. I know it sounds cliche, and there might be a lot of issues and things that cause us not to want to love one another, maybe not to cause us not to love you, or any of that. But this day, just help us realize that what's in these scriptures, what's in these stories and these narratives in the Bible, really they just point to loving one another. In including one another, being inclusivistic, including everyone, because that's what you've called us to do. And as we leave here today and just live our lives, just help us to be these people, these agents of love, because really all that you really, all that we really need is just a little love. Amen.